Thank you, Bruce. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this talk is sort of uh, the third in a trilogy of talks. I've given a talk um, about altered states of consciousness, uh, sort of in terms of cognitive processes, and then a, a talk um, in terms of uh, sort of neuroscientific uh, machinery, uh, neural firing and neural wiring. Uh, today, I want to stand back and do a bigger uh, sort of cognitive science thing, uh, a little bit more philosophical, and try and get an understanding of what's uh, going on in some of these uh, states and transformations we're talking about. Now, first of all, I want to give some credit where credit is uh, due. Um, if I talk about uh, relevance realization, that's based on published work with Tim Lovecraft and Greg Richards, and also with Leo Ferraro. Um, work on altered states of consciousness is, goes towards uh, a lot of work with Anderson Todd, and his uh, work is, as we mentioned in our lab, uh, the Consciousness and Wisdom Studies Lab. Also, uh, work with Richard Wu on that. Um, uh, work that I've also done with uh, Christopher Master Pietro with Philip Misovic on uh, meaning in life. And uh, work I've done with Daniel Craig, uh, especially about uh, connections between uh, psychedelics, uh, insight, and flow. And further work that I've done with both uh, Leo Ferrara and Ariad Cara Bennett on mindfulness and also flow. So, there, yeah, I hope I've covered everybody. Um, there's a lot of people I get to work with, and um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, very, uh, it, it's very important that uh, I, I try to uh, indicate uh, that a lot of people have helped uh, the thinking that I'm going to try and give with you today. Okay, so for a long time I won't be talking about psychedelics, which might seem disconcerting, because what I'm really trying to do is build up a uh, conceptual framework for trying to give us a way of thinking about basically this spectrum that the conference is named, microdosing to mystical experiences. Um, we're generating lots of data, and I'll talk a little bit briefly about data that's generated in my lab, but this isn't going to be a, uh, a data-driven talk. Uh, I'm much more interested in this talk of trying to understand what's going on, giving us a better conceptual vocabulary, a better theoretical grammar. And so I want to start with something, and I'm going to use that as a way of building into it. So this has happened to me uh, several times in my life and <coughs> experience, and I hope it's something similar has happened to you because I don't give us a common ground for talking. I'm reading a particular philosopher, all right, and I'm reading through the material, and I, you know, and I'm following the arguments, and I'm making uh, the inferences, and I'm even coming to change some of my beliefs, although typically philosophers don't change their beliefs. Um, <laughs> uh, but, right, and then I'm going along and I'm doing that, and that's fine, and then there's, there's a shift that occurs. And it's very hard to articulate, but I thought it might be a good place to start. I go from just thinking about it and believing about it, I suddenly get the sense of what it would be like to live in that alternative worldview that the philosophers articulate. Has some of you had a, that experience? Some of you put your hands up. So you know what I'm talking about. There's that shift. You go from like, oh yeah, yeah, and all of a sudden, you're sort of, like I remember, this, this happened when I was reading Whitehead, and for like a week I was seeing things in Whiteheadian terms. <laughs> it, the, the philosophy becomes more adverbial than just a set of beliefs for you. It's a, it's a way of being. And I'm just really interested in that transformation. And what seems to be going on there, right, is that you seem to be sort of a change, not just, as I say, in, in beliefs. And it's certainly not real. I mean, we use perceptual metaphors, but it's not a change in my perception. I'm not sort of going around hallucinating. Right, so getting past the metaphors, well, what's going on there? And I, I think what's going on there is uh, a transformation in you know, my salience landscape. So what do I mean by a salience lens? Salience is how, you know, how things stand out for you, how they gather your attention. And as many of you know, there's a lot of work going on now. And I, if I had a, a two, two or three hours, I'd talk to you about attention right now, too. A lot of work going on in about attention. And what a salience landscape is, presumably, I hope I'm very salient for you. People around you a little less salient, and until I said it to you, your left big toe wasn't salient to you at all. And of course, now it is. And that's one of the creepy things about attention and how it works. And so you've got this thing constantly shifting around. And part of what seems to be going on there is that salience landscape seems to be part of the way in which attention is helping us to screen out the ocean of irrelevant information and allow in the information that's relevant to us. And it's constantly doing this in a very complex, recursive, self-organizing and dynamic manner. The salience landscape. And most of this is going on below the level of any introspective 
access, and it's below the level of my beliefs because it seems to be that which in which my inferences and my beliefs are operating, rather than something that is being generated by my inferences and my beliefs. And that seems to be part of the shift that's going on there. And I, I found that really, really interesting. So, see, it's, what seems to happen is the way in which I'm identifying things in the world and the identities that I'm assuming, the roles, seem to be changed when I'm going through that change. The way I'm sort of presented to the world and the world is presented to me. Sort of, if, you could, if you'll allow me a metaphor, I'm an agent and the world makes sense to me. It becomes a particular arena to me. And that agent arena relationship seems to have been altered in that transformation. Now I find that uh, really, really interesting uh, because and that seems to be sort of a fundamental thing behind what people are talking about in more abstract levels when they're talking about things like a philosophical uh, worldview. But what can really happen with that is the possibility of it giving us a, a bit of a way of talking about an important thing that is coming to the fore in, in psychology, which is this notion of meaning in life. So this is the factor that, that people rate above and beyond considering that their life is moral or that they have subjective well-being, they rate how meaningful their life is. And part of what seems to be going on in that it, it is this idea of a connection, a connection between sort of how you're seeing things and how things are presenting themselves to you. So Susan Wolf in her book, Meaning in Life and Why It Matters, talks about this. We use metaphors for what we talk about when we talk about meaning in life, we say things like, well, I, you know, I want to be connected to something bigger than myself. And she says, well, not literally, right? If I chain you to a mountain, you just go, oh, wow. <laughs> wow, good life, right? <laughs> and, and then she says, part of it seems to be that we want to be, we want to be really attracted to something, but that's not enough, because if we're really sort of attracted to something that's trivial, that doesn't have a big transformative impact on our life, then we're not thinking that it's really meaning in life. So she gives the example of somebody that does something like this, and they says, well, you know, I finally met like my life partner. I just I want to dedicate my, myself to like, this, this being. I want you to meet them. And they take you home and they introduce you to a cactus. <laughs> and you, go, you don't go, oh, wow, I'm so happy. You go, oh, no. <laughs> Right? So there's a normativity there. There's a normativity there. And part of what's going on there is that meaning in life seems to have these two components to it. And she phrases it like this. You want subjective attractiveness to meet objective attraction. You want the world right, to have right, some sort of value to you, some transformative impact on you above and beyond the fact that you just value it. It has to have some kind of power. Now, there's a lot of metaphysical problems about that because it sounds like I'm invoking metaphysical uh, value. I'm not going to get into that right now, but I want to. I want you to think of this, th this right, this agent arena relationship. There's two parts to it, right? There's how I'm attracted to things, the perspective I have on them, what it's like for me to be to have a particular salience landscape, and then there's this other side, this participatory side, how something is changing me, how I'm participating in something bigger than me how I'm participating in something that is altering or transforming me in a fundamental way. Does that make sense? So that you've got this dynamic relationship that's a, sort of at the core of meaning in life. And it has these two sides to it. A perspectival side, what's it like for me? You know, how am I, your salience landscape is how you're attracted to things. And then there's a participatory side, how the world is objectively attractive to you. And I take that to mean, what kind of transformative power does it have over you? What can, how can you participate in it? Belong to it? Okay. So I think that's very interesting. And then we can talk a little bit more about this. And the way of talking about that is the work that John Wright did. And he did work based on uh, the work of the philosopher Iris Murdoch. And he, talked to, he asked us to talk about a particular uh, situation. It's a Gadonkin experiment. And he says, so there's uh, a woman, and she has a daughter-in-law. And she sort of thinks her daughter-in-law is sort of coarse, right? And just not up to her son's standards. And, you know, really loud. And then what happens is she goes, th there's this transformation that occurs. And uh, Murdoch describes it as a transformation of attention and how things are salient. She says, she realizes she was wrong. That her daughter isn't coarse. She's really, really well-grounded. 
And she's not sort of loud. She's really spontaneous and authentic. And she's not beneath her son. She's actually really good for her son. Now, and what Murdoch asks us to sit, realize, and, and Wright emphasizes is, what's happening there is two things. The mother-in-law is getting an insight, changing how she's <coughs> framing the daughter-in-law, but it's bi-directional. It's both the arena is changing and the agent is changing, because the mother-in-law realized how she has been framing things, the kind of agent she is, needs to be changed. It's not just that she's reframing the daughter-in-law, she's reframing herself. There's kinds of a, a transactional framing, a transformation, a transframing of both sides that's going on. Now that's very, very interesting. And this is actually an idea that the ancient people talked a lot more about, and we sort of lost this a bit, which is why Wright and other people uh, are trying to bring it back. Right? There's this idea, right? This idea of, right, as I'm transformed, I see this thing, realize it more deeply, and as, I, as it is transformed for me, that has an impact back on me, I, and it loops like this. I am transformed, and I'm transformed how I see it, and then it is disclosed to me in a different way, and that transforms how it, it impacts on me, and it loops, and you get that sort of mutually accelerating disclosure. And the Greeks had a wonderful word for this. It comes from Plato. Anagoge. It comes from Plato's myth of the cave, and they made it into a movie in 1999 uh, called The Matrix. Uh, with Keanu Reeves. Uh, and the basic idea is you're locked in this world, right? And you have to break up. He's called Neo because he has to change, right? He has to change. Right? And the world he can move into has to be a fundamentally different world. There's a reciprocal change. There's this right, mutual disclosure, mutual transformation. Some of you know this, and this is something that I've studied more directly in a more concrete instance. How many of you have experienced what Chick Mahai calls the flow state? Okay, so the flow state is when you're like deeply immersed, right? You're deeply engaged. And there's, there's this, you know, there, you feel deeply at one because there has been this mutual transformation. From the world side, there's a sense of, you know, discovery and super salience. Your salience landscape is just being altered. But from your side, you're being fundamentally transformed. Your sense of subjective time, right, your sense of self-consciousness, your whole agency is being transformed. That's why it's called flow. You get this, you get this tight coupling between how the world is changing and how you are changing together. So, that's anagogic. Sorry, that's really pretentious because I sort of tried to sum up all of Plato in about <laughs> five minutes, and I'm sure I'll be punished for that. Okay. <laughs> all right. So now I want to talk about the opposite. The opposite of anagogic, when you get locked and you can't get out. Now, first of all, I want to talk about it positively and then negatively. So the notion comes from work done by Harry Frankfurt. Some of you may know Frankfurt's work. He's famous for writing the essay on bullshit, which has become, a, a, of course, very relevant given certain things we won't talk about happening in the United States. So what's going on there is he's done a lot of work about uh, a thing he talks, a state he calls called uh, things that are unthinkable to us. But he has something very specific he means by that. And it's the opposite of what I've been talking about. OK, so the way to do it is by doing a concrete example with you. My son, Jason, who I love dearly, lives with me right now. He's just finished university at U of T. I got to teach him. Made me feel very old. There you go. <laughs> OK, so right, he lives with me. Now, I can think, hey, I can kick Jason out. And if I do, I can work out all the implications. I'd have more money. The apartment would be cleaner. I could sleep at my apartment every night. I wouldn't have to go away sometimes. <laughs> I can think those thoughts. I can imagine the scenarios. What Frankfurt means is not that I can't do that. Of course I can do all of that. I can think the thoughts. I can run the propositions. I can run the implications. 
I can imagine the scenario, but you know what I can't do? What he means by being unthinkable is I can't put myself into the agent arena relationship where that will actually become a viable option for me. In that sense, it's unthinkable to me. I just can't become that person, and I can't be in that world where <coughs> I can do that sort of thing. Does that make sense? <coughs> and that's a different thing. See, we're talking about that. So there's a way in which, we, we, and he talks about this positively, that agent arena relationship can be locked down, right? And you don't want it to transform. Now that's positive. Now, so we've got, you know, a positive version of it being transformed, a positive version where it's not being transformed, but now what about a negative version of where it's not being transformed? So what do I mean by that? What if you're stuck? Right? What if you're stuck in, in the very real sense of that, right? You need to break out of the worldview you're in. You need to, and I don't mean that. I made that clear with you. I don't mean your, your beliefs and your propositions. You need anagoge. You need to break out. You need that transformation. But you can't do it. Right? You are, it's in Frankfurt said, it's unthinkable how to get that other worldview. And you, you need, may even know that you need to get there, but you can't get there. You don't know how to bring about the transformation in your salience landscape. You do not know how to bring about the anagogic transformation of the ancient arena relationship. Now, that brings me to another aspect. As you're considering such a difficult transformation, you run into some very difficult problems about trying to reason your way into the transformation. Now this goes towards work done by L.A. Paul, oh, by the way, who's coming to UFT in two weeks to speak. Uh, so if you get a chance at UTISM, uh, the Cognitive Science Conference, come and see L.A. Paul. Uh, that book, Transformative Experience, is a, is, a, is a really good book. Okay, so Paul talks about certain kinds of experiences and they have these important features to them. And they're going to make use of this, this machinery of meaning in life, this perspectival and participatory aspect that I've already talked to you about. She talks about what she calls an epistemic transformation. She gives an example. Somebody gives you a fruit that is unlike any fruit you've ever had. She actually has a concrete example. And apparently for some people it tastes really yummy, and for other people it tastes like vomit. And that's what you want to try it, right? And, and so her point is, you don't know what it will be like to taste that fruit until you've tasted it. Do you understand? You won't know until after you've done it. She calls this an epistemic transformation. Now notice what that is. That's, that's this perspectival knowing that I've been talking about. You don't know what your salience landscape is going to be like when you taste this fruit until after you've tasted the fruit. You're ignorant of it. Now, it's tasting a fruit, so it's not a big risk. So most of us will probably say, yeah, I'll try it. But do you understand her example, right? You don't know what it's going to be like until after you've done it. Because it's not a matter of belief. It's not a matter of inference. It's a matter about what is your salience landscape going to be like. She then talks about personal transformation. And this involves that participatory stuff, being participating in something that is changing you as a person. She talks about the things that you go through where you are changed and you, the, the, your set of preferences and what you value is altered. And so you don't know what kind of person you're going to be like until after you've gone through that change. Right? So she puts the two together. And you have both an epistemic change, changing your perspectival knowing, and a personal change, a change in your participatory knowing, she calls that a transformative experience. Now, why is, why is that so important, that transformative experience? Well, first of all, most transformative experiences are irreversible and therefore risky. They carry some degree of risk, but here's what's really important about them. You face them with a deep kind of ignorance. Because you don't know what it's going to be like, and you don't know who you're going to be until after you do it. So 
You're ignorant, right, of how it's going to turn out. But you say, well, then I don't do it. But then you're also ignorant of what you're missing. You're equally ignorant. <laughs> equally ignorant. Right? You're equally ignorant. <clears throat> okay. So why is that important? Why that is important is, and she, I, there's a technical argument she goes into, and I'm just going to refer to it. And I, I'm going to talk a bit more about it at the YouTube, Utism conference where Ali Paul is there, so hopefully she and I can get into an argument. Um, <laughs> but she makes the point that there is, no, there is no way to sort of reason your way through this. Because you can't calculate the probabilities of the future events because you don't know what they are. And you can't say, well, at least I'll rely on my values, because you don't know what they're going to be. <clears throat> so you can't sort of do Bayesian probability or you know, any kind of direct inferential moves to get your way through. So she gives a Gagankin experiment to try and make this clear. And then she relates it to real life examples, because that's what philosophers do. They give you a Gagankin experiment, you go, oh, whoa, whoa. And then they say, how? This is like your life. And you go, oh, no, right? And so that's how it works. And so the Gagankin experiment is like this. She said, so your friends come up to you, and they have absolute convincing evidence, indubitable evidence, that they can do what they're going to offer to do to you. They offer to turn you into a vampire. Should you do it? <laughs> Should you do it? Well, you don't know what you're going to be like when you're a vampire, because you don't know what the salient landscape is like. And you know that you, know, you can't judge the vampire's life by your current set of preferences, because you're going to have a vampire set of preferences over here. Well, I won't do it. What are you missing? <laughs> well, I should do it. What are you getting into? <laughs> Okay, so the point of a Gedanken experiment, right, is to sort of, it lowers our guard and we sort of let the idea in, and then she drops the shoe, right? She says, you know what that's like in real life? Having your first child. And you go, oh, right. <laughs> Deciding to get into a long-term relationship with someone. Because you know what? What it's like to be loved by that person and to love that person is a different salience landscape than what you have right now. And you're going to be transformed. You're going to participate in their identity changing, and they're going to change yours. Should you do it? See, now it's starting to, oh, right. <laughs> Okay, so let's put these two together. We can talk about people being stuck, like I did earlier. This is they can't imagine how to get into an alternative worldview. They don't know how to activate anagogy. They can't get there. But now, after going through L.A. Paul, we can also talk about people are can be stupefied, right? They cannot know. They can't figure out how to decide this because the rational machinery of mis of decision making is not available to them. How do they do it? Now, it's of course very possible, although I've analytically talked about them as distinct, it's very possible to have both at the same time. You're stuck and you're stupefied. You're existentially trapped. You don't know how to activate anagogy to transform and you don't know how to decide if you should or not. So, as you can imagine, being stuck is bad. Because part of being stuck is the stupefied. You don't even know if it's bad to be stuck. Should I stay here? Okay. Now, what's really interesting is I mean, I've tried to paint this as a very stark thing. And it is very stark. It's very hard. Now, I'm, I, 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 I've been thinking about that a lot. And L.A. Paul has some things she talks about. Uh, but I, I sort of stepped back and I, I, I did more of an Aristotelian thing. I started trying to think and talk to people and review, you know, what do people actually do? 
what do people do when they're facing this kind of thing? Okay, so let's do it. You know, what do people do when they're sort of considering having a child? Do they just sort of sit there? Stop, get stupefied, oh my god. Or do they just wait for the Darwinian machinery to hit them and knock them off? <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes. But I noticed that a lot of people do this and it's becoming more common. They get a pet. <laughs> they get a pet and then they do creepy things with the pet. <laughs> Like they, they have pictures of themselves with the pet, and they, you know, when it's brutal, right? Like they have a pet. Or they consider, and, and now this has become like, I, this has become like dating advice, right? Um, considering getting into a long-term relationship, they go on a trip with the person. I, I've heard, that one is sort of, that sounds fun and pleasant. But of course, it could be hellacious in terms of that, which I guess is the point. The other one, apparently, is to paint your house with them. <coughs> I don't quite know why that one works, but apparently. Now, right? And what about being a vampire? See, my friend Anderson, right? right? He, he could say more about this. Because, I mean, this sounds, this is not pretentious. I mean this as a direct compliment. He's, a de he's developing, I think, you know, a cognitive science, even a philosophy of what's going on in role-playing games. Because that's the interesting thing in role see, you know, L.A. Paul says, you can't figure out whether or not you should be a vampire by dressing up as a human being and running around in the dark at night. Because you're not a vampire. You're just a really weird person. <laughs> but, you see, when you play, when you play a role-playing game, you do this weird thing. What you do is you create this avatar that you identify with. And that avatar is actually in a world as a vampire. And people get very attached to their avatars. Notice that each one of these things I did was a case of human beings doing this really interesting thing. They do symbolic identification. And notice it's, it's two-way. When they're, when they're identifying, when they're symbolically identifying the pet as a child, they're also symbolically identifying as a parent. Same thing with the role-playing game. Human beings have this enormous capacity for symbolic identification. And it, what it does, I want to try and explore with you, I think this is a rational strategy. It's not a deductive strategy. But I think it's a rational strategy that they're pursuing. Now, what I'm obviously, the one you want me to mention, because many of you I hope are thinking about it, is a very powerful way that people use to try and get out of uh, being existentially trapped by using symbolic identification in which there's an agent in an arena, and you know that as therapy. Because that's what therapy is doing. Okay, so the interesting thing about the symbolic identification is it's a kind of analogy. But it's not an analogy of propositions. It's not an analogy of belief. It's an inactive analogy. Right? People are trying to enact an, anago, an analogous agent arena relationship. And, they, and you've got to do this right. There's, there's artistry and skill involved. They have to get it apt. So what do I mean by that? You've got to get it balanced. Right? This right, inactive analogy has to be similar enough to their current life that they can right, keep touch with it. Right? Meaningfully compare. But it also has to be similar enough to the alternative world they're considering. And I don't mean just sim similar in how it appears. It has to be able to activate some of that perspectival machinery. It has to be able to trigger some of that participatory machinery. Because this is not, I've been saying this again and again, this is not at the level of beliefs and inferences. No, so there, you've got to get that right. So there's this, there's, it's like a really well-crafted metaphor it has to balance, right? It has to get that just right. It really takes very sophisticated abilities of insight and relevance realization to get that working properly. Now, I would argue that human beings figured this out a long time ago. Because there is a form of enacted analogy, enacted analogy, symbolic identification that also is supposed to trigger and activate anagogic. That's ritual. That's ritual. 
That's how ritual operates. I don't mean ritual in the neurotic sense. I mean in the anthropological sense, ritual behavior. So for example, I do, I'm a Tai Chi player. I've been doing Tai Chi since 91, which is what, 27 years? Oh my god, long time. I teach it. And the thing is, right, so you know, when you're doing, it's a, like, the point about it is, it's an inactive, an, an analogy, right? You're trying to transform how you live in your body and how your salience landscape is disclosing the world to you. You're not making, just making news, you're trying to bring about this, right, this analogy. But it's also anagogic. The point of Tai Chi is to get you into the flow state. Taoism is the religion of flow. Tai Chi is its main psychotechnology for bringing it about. So when I'm doing Tai Chi, I've got this analogy, right? This inactive analogy of an alternative way of being that's also activating flow, anagogic, ha actually helping me to trans radically transform the agent arena relationship. So what I'm suggesting to you, when people are trapped, they, what they need is a state of consciousness, that's the perspectival side, and the state of being, that's the participatory side, that can afford this kind of transformation. And what I've indicated, because of that happiness, it requires tremendous cognitive flexibility, tremendous insight, tremendous improvement and enhancement of your relevance realization machinery. I'm familiar with Daniel's work. I, unfortunately, I couldn't be here for his talk. I'm hoping to see the tape. But I'm sure he was talking to you about the enhancement of insight and cognitive flexibility. So, I want to say that one way of understanding everything I've been talking about is to revive an old term. Gnosis. The problem with reviving that is now you think I'm reading Dan Brown, <laughs> and that I think that Jesus Christ was the ancestor to the French monarchy. I'm not talking about any of that, OK? Uh, I, I actually have a heuristic, which of course is sometimes false, but it's never cost me anything. Here's my heuristic. I don't believe conspiracy theories. So that's not what I'm talking about. So insofar as this invokes conspiracy theories and rumors, nope. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about, right, is the Gnostics saw symbolic identification rituals. They saw to, uh, right, they saw to enhance those rituals with altered states of consciousness. Altered states of consciousness that enhance their cognitive flexibility, their insight capacities, their relevance realization. And they were trying to get, right, that symbolic identification through ritual conjoined to altered states of consciousness in order to be saved. Now they thought they had a whole supernatural mythology. I don't believe in supernatural mythology. But I think that supernatural mythology can be plausibly understood as they were trying, and many philosophers have argued this way, Hans Jonas famously, for example, what they were trying to do was articulate being existentially trapped. And they were trying to articulate a method symbolic identification, ritual tech, psychotechnology, altered states of consciousness in order to afford liberation from being existentially trapped. And that's what they meant. That's the knowing they meant. The Gnosis. Gnosis is not epistemy. It is not propositional knowledge. It is not explanatory knowledge. This is this perspectival, participatory, transformative way of knowing, way of being. That's what they were talking about. As I say, I'm not avowing their particular mythological structure. I am interested in what was going on there. And you see them very carefully trying to get these apt, and constantly revising it, these apt symbols. So what I think Gnosis is that you have an altered state of consciousness that enhances cognitive flexibility, insight, flow, imagination, right, that is set within a ritual framing, that is set within an enacted, analogic, anagogic, cognitive framing. 
So that gnosis is an altered state of consciousness within this ritual and framing that can bring about liberation from being existentially trapped. Now, one of the things I'm interested in is the degree to which psychedelics could bring about gnosis. Now, it took me a long time to get there. <laughs> I hope you thought the journey was worth it. Because I'm trying to figure out the language and the concepts and think, why do people want this? What is it doing for them? What problems are these states solving for them? And I don't mean Bob's problem with this or Samantha's problem with that. I mean, you know, the cognitive structures and processes that are problematic for them. So, I'm particularly interested um, in the capacity for psychedelic states to trigger mystical experiences because mystical experiences seem to be instances where you're bringing about this radical transformation of meaning in life. So why might that be the case? <clears throat> well, think about it. Uh, so there's some very current work coming out about trying to experimentally manipulate judgments of meaning in life. So rather than just relying on the philosophical work, uh, you have uh, Samantha Henselman, Henselman's work, 2013, 2016. I got to have dinner with her when she was applying for a job here at U of T. They didn't give her the job. You know. uh, but, uh, so I got to talk to her at length about it, so it wasn't just reading her work, I got to discuss it with her. And uh, what she found was that you can enhance people's judgment that their lives is mean are meaningful if you give them patterns. She calls it coherence. Basically, you can give them sort of scenes that make sense to them. Basically, if you put them into, if you trigger people's agent arena relationship, right? Oh, that makes sense, I fit in, I know what to do here and I know what this is, I know what this scene is, and I know what I can do here, then they rate their life more meaningful. It's amazing. You just put them into an experiment. How meaningful is your life? And then you do this, show them these things, oh, and they rate it higher. That's a power of Gnosis, right? And it turns out, and Martella and Steger did a good review paper in 2016 on this, Right? That in addition to coherence, right, people also judge their life, that, that they have more meaning in life if, there's, if they've had experiences that are significant. Where significant is that participatory aspect. How transformative, how deeply right, connecting to reality was the experience. And we know from the Griffiths Lab right, that mystical experiences are rated as some of the most significant that people have. And that seems to have long-term, maybe permanent, but at least long-term changes to their cognitive processing. For example, measures of openness are increased, things like that. Right? There's also a third factor, purpose, but I'm gonna put that aside because I wanna talk about the first two, coherence and significance. What is a more coherent experience than a mystical experience? Right? In a classical sense, that terrific sense of that oneness, unity, and, what, and as I just said, some of the most tr significant experiences people have are mystical experiences. Mystical experiences give sort of m massive coherence, massive significance. So we, I'm just going to talk about this briefly because we're just still processing the data. We did uh, both an in-lab study and uh, Mechanical Turk. We had, what is it, well, close to 900 results? Uh, basically, we took standard, uh, you know, psychologically valid scales of mystical experience, scales of meaning in life, and just did a correlational study. See, what's the relationship between mystical experience and meaning in life? Turns out to be pretty good. It's about 0.29. And that lines up with other things. People rate their lives as more meaningful if they have more flow experiences. And of course, there's a lot of similarities between flow and mystical experiences. Interestingly, uh, we did a sort of a sub-analysis, uh, and this seems to be bearing up, so take this with a grain of salt, right? But the insight aspects of the mystical experience, the sense of insight, making sense, right? That correlates with meaning in life judgment at about 0.35. 
which is almost as good as having a religious framework to process your mystical experience. So if you're religious and you have a mystical experience, the impact seems to be something like 0.36. Right? Well, that's the relation I should say. I shouldn't use the word impact. Do you know what I mean? That's the relation. So this is you know, this very, very interesting idea right, that we can bring about fundamental sort of, sort of transformation in meaning in life by triggering mystical experiences, because mystical experiences seem to invoke this kind of, they, at least they, they invoke the cognitive flexibility of the machinery that can be taken into a ritual interpretation. It can be part of the activation of Gnosis. So, why do this? Well, here's the thing with, if you go back to all these strategies that are people, people are using, think about having a path. Why do the path? Because it's reversible. And it's not as risky. I mean, the, I mean, I made a joke about this the other day. You know, having a pet is like having a child that it's morally okay to leave alone for a day. <laughs> like if you say, I left my one-year-old alone for the day, people go, you're a monster. If you say, I left my cat alone for the day, they went, yeah. Right? This simple experiences, Gnostic states, allow us that same kind of thing. They allow us to sort of probe an alternative identity, an alternative worldview, but in a way that we can step back from if we need to. So is it deductively rational? No, I don't think it's deductively rational. But I think it's a case of the best possible analogical reasoning we could have. And it's the best way of trying to manage the risk of deep transformation. Again, I'm not saying this meets sort of epistemic gold standards, but I'm saying it's the best I think we could have in this situation, given the nature of the problem people are facing. It means we should be paying attention more to the implicit rationality of mystical experiences, their Gnostic rationality. We should be paying less attention to the content of people's psychedelic and mystical experiences, because it looks like it's much more the transformation in their cognitive processing that's actually efficacious for them, even though they find the content very salient. Now, you might say to me, well, you know, this was all an argument by an analogy. An argument by an analogy are not valid, right? They're weak. You're making use of dialectical reasoning, John. You've been reading too much Plato, right? <laughs> and the idea here is the dialectical reasoning is not deductively valid because it depends on non-inferential processes of reframing and transframing, right? And then you may say, you know, that sort of experimental aspect you were talking about with Gnosis, it's not really, you know, experimental because, you know, it's uncontrolled and all that and unconfounded. You shouldn't be using that term. Right? And, and that's, both of those are completely legitimate points. But let me respond to them. First of all, I, I, like I said, although that Gnostic rationality is deductively weak, I think we're not paying attention to how much analogy and metaphor are pervasive and powerful influences within our cognition. And I do not think that is coincidental that we say things like, you know, my talk was filled with metaphor, because that, of course, is a metaphor. But I hope you see what I'm saying, or at least grasp my point, or perhaps understand it. Try to say something about how you have sized up situations and created an agent arena relationship without invoking. So perhaps that judgment is a little too
too strong. I mean, the point I made, is, uh, and I can't make this argument here, many of you have seen it elsewhere in other talks, I think the machinery by this existential kind of experimentation, not an epistemic experimentation. Nevertheless, the issues are importantly analogous. The thing we care about, right, in epistemic experimentation is a human capacity for self-deception. Most of the scientific method is designed to subvert a very powerful machinery of self-deception. That's why we do it. So we should do something analogous to an existential experiment. We should bring to bear machinery to try and address the potential threat of self-deception. So within the ritual context that I was mentioning, right? We should make sure that people are trained in the psychotechnologies that help to reduce self-deception. Psychotechnologies of mindfulness. Psychotechnologies of active, open-mindedness. Psychotechnologies of overcoming egocentrism. Now that sounds a little bit down, right? Because it's like, wow, Rebecca's like turning out to be a prude. He's saying, you know, we should be using these things only in these really well understood contexts within a community of people who are taking great pains to deal with the threat of self deception. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Because if the argument is right, we're playing with cognitive fire. And, right, we should play with it correctly. I mean, it does. I mean, it gives you it, 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 gives, it, it can be tremendously liberating. I know a Tai Chi player, right, like myself, early on in their Tai Chi career, they did Tai Chi on psilocybin. And it gave them exactly the kind of experience I've been talking to you about, this Gnostic. And they got a sense of, this is what it's like. This is what it should be like. And this became a phenomenological touchstone for them. They used that as a way, as a benchmark, to constantly improve their Tai Chi for decades. So it is powerful. But precisely because it's powerful, I do think we should have the same concern within existential experimentation for our proclivities towards self-deception as we have in our epistemic experimentation. I think psychedelic substances should be used within a ritual context that can afford gnosis and potentially mystical experience. And that ritual context should be set within a community that is dedicated to the psychotechnologies of alleviating self-deception. We should try to get clear about how we're thinking about all of this. And I don't just mean epistemically. That is important. We need, and I, I, in other talks, I address this. I'm not, I'm not trying to pay a left-handed compliment here. We, we have to get clear you know, about the, the, the cognitive machinery, the, the, right, the neurological process. We have to do all of that. But we also have to get clear about the conceptual and ultimately existential framework we are bringing to bear when if we're proposing Right? A transformation in our society about our attitudes and use of these substances. And I hope I've done a little bit about trying to do that with you today. Thank you very much.
Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. Um, are you asking me to disclose elements of my personal biography, which I'm probably not going to do? No, no, no not to that extent, but um, I guess the question was, because you, I don't know if this was what you meant by saying, like, sorry, it took me a while to get there, but is it in that same sense of... I just meant it took me a long time in the talk to get to the point where I was talking about psychedelics. Oh, okay. I don't know. I was <laughs> questioning towards, like, did it take you time to get to the top? Oh, well... That wasn't my, that wasn't the reference of what I was saying, but yes, it did take me longer. I mean, and, and a lot of people have been uh, very significant in helping me. Uh, Anderson Todd, Daniel Craig, uh, uh, have had a huge impact on sort of shifting my thinking to more and more uh, talk about. I had done, I, I've been practicing mindfulness in Tai Chi for a very long time, so I was always open to the cognitive import of altered states of consciousness. But the, the, the psychedelic uh, dimension of it uh, has only sort of been recent, recently come to the fore. And part of that has been because uh, the science has gotten better. So as a scientist, that's important. I now see some important connections uh, between the machinery of psychedelics and the machinery of insight problem solving, for example. Uh, and I also see important connections uh, between the alterations in states of consciousness and neurodynamics and neuroconductivity in the brain and important other cognitive states we study. So that was part of it. But part of it was also, uh, oh, sorry, this sounds self-congratulatory. Part of it, though, was this kind of work I'm doing now, where I'm starting to see that, there's a, that it might be possible in a philosophically legitimate way to talk about a Gnostic kind of rationality in these experiences. And that's part of what I tried to share with you today. Yeah, I definitely saw this transformation from when I had lectures with you, and I don't know if this uh, shift had taken place back then or kind of currently, but definitely seeing that we're gearing towards this aspect of like shifting the global consciousness, and especially with having talks like this and conferences like this and the mind matters one that you also did with the next camera. Right. Well, thank you. Can I have a, a Alex? Hi. Um, you mentioned at one point uh, that uh, you said you thought the, um, the change to cognitive processing was more important than the content. Yeah. And um, what I'm wondering is uh, what do you, would, you know, make of the idea that uh, the possibility, right, that changes in cognitive, one, of the, one change in cognitive processing, right, is that it might give access to valuable content right. that would not otherwise be as available. Sure. And so I'm wondering what you make of that idea and like and from both like a scientific perspective, right? Sure, sure. But maybe your comment was just about science or, or and also from like a personal pragmatic sort of perspective. So. Right. So I think you're making a good point, Alex. I mean you always do. Um, and I I didn't mean to be exclusionary. I didn't. I wasn't trying to say you know you shouldn't pay attention at all to the content or that. I was trying to reshift the emphasis. Here's the reason: because the content is so variable, but the, the cognitive processing, the, co the changes, the changes in cognition seem to be uh, so much more important. And the reason why I was making the argument is that I think by the time we get to the content, uh, we're talking about uh, sort of it reaching the level of belief and perhaps mental imagery that is basically an effect of these, trans of these transformations that are taking place at a more uh, perspectival and participatory level. So, the, I, 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 yeah, the content could be valuable, but I'm worried that if we focus on them, we're going to make the mistake of flipping cause and effect around too much. So that's my concern. So you mentioned uh, at one point how if we're not careful with this stuff, it could be kind of, well, we are playing with cognitive fire. Sure. Um, can you elaborate on what you think the more serious consequences could be of irresponsible use of psychedelics? Well, I, I mean, there's people who are much better uh, about uh, the empirical work on that. I, I, you know, that psychedelics are less addictive, they don't provoke suicide. So I know there was a lot of Nixonian misinformation about the dangers. But, I mean, we have to, like, here, let, let me give you, I hope, oh, I think a helpful analogy. We need to pay more attention to the dark side of mindfulness. Yeah, not if you're not in a room. <laughs> right? So what's happening right now is we're getting, we're getting the mindfulness revel, and look, I practice and teach, and I publish and do scientific work on mindfulness. I'm not some hostile, right? But, right? We're in the middle of the mindfulness revolution in which mindfulness cures everything and it will solve the problems of the world and blah, blah, blah. And we're forgetting 
Right? We're forgetting the dark stuff that comes up in mindfulness practices for people. You can get dissociation, you can get really sort of traumatic memory recovery, you can get all kinds of bad stuff happening. Willoughby Britton did a, a talk a while ago and she sort of went through this host of all this dark stuff that can happen. And so my concern is exactly the same thing, that we need to pay very ter careful attention, try, that we, I mean, right now we're trying to sell an idea and I get that. But at some point, we have to step back and start collecting the other data, too. Right? What, like, I'm very concerned about the fact that altered states of consciousness, on one hand, have the, pro have the properties of insight. But you know what they also have the properties of? If you'll allow me to talk about the, the term that Frankfurt used, they have the property of bullshit. <laughs> See, the difference between a lie, you, we use a metaphor that we lie to ourselves. You can't lie to yourself. Hey, John, believe P, but it's not true. No. You can't lie to yourself. It's a metaphor, it's a bad metaphor. And the difference between a liar and a bullshitter is, a liar depends on your commitment to the truth to change your behavior. You see, the difference with bullshitting is, the bullshitter doesn't, tries to make you indifferent to the truth. They try to get you to change your behavior by making something catchy or salient to you. You watch the commercial. There's the room. People are drinking alcohol. All these attractive, happy people go into a bar. <laughs> OK? You know it's not true. And they know you're, you know it's not true. It doesn't matter. They make the stimulus salient. And so what do you do? You buy the product. You can't lie to yourself. But you know what you can do? You can bullshit yourself. Because you can change what's salient to you just by paying attention to it. You see, and what altered states of consciousness do is they alter our salient landscape dramatically. They make us, yes, they open us up to insight, but they also make us vulnerable to bullshit and to self-deception because of that. That's my concern. We have time for one more. Yes, I, I think, I mean, so this goes to work, the, the, I think the sort of core of my work, which is the meaning crisis in Western society, and the fact that we have lost, we have lost an encompassing framework that does this for us. We've lost it, we've lo I, I do this with my students. I'll say, where do you go for information? The internet. Where do you go for knowledge? The university. Where do you go for wisdom? Wow. Well, yeah. So the point I'm making is we have lost our culture, not all cultures, ours, has lost we've lost right, institutional frameworks, sets, systematic sets of psychotechnologies to uh, that do exactly what you're saying, allow people to in, like to integrate and incorporate these kinds of transformations into their worldview. So thank you very much, everyone.